Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are. Um, this is actually the first of a series of events and publications planned as part of the Egypt Programme's project on climate change mitigation. And as part of the program's mandate, it will start uh, in Egypt today, but it will uh, grow to expand uh, near regional uh, uh, countries and the Horn of Africa. So climate change is being particularly keenly felt in areas with stretched resources and the Middle East and parts of Africa <laughs> certainly fit that bill. Now in Egypt, it's a looming and ever more serious threat. The most, uh, the most densely populated uh, country in the region. Um, you have the ever increasing demands of a burgeoning population and economic growth. And that means that already scarce resources are being stretched very thin. There are other problems as well. That 96% desert, Egypt is one of the world's most water scarce countries. It gets 560 cubic meters um, of water a year per person. Um, the UN puts water scarcity at about a thousand cubic meters per person a year. And this is particularly relevant when you consider that um, about 30% of the population is directly involved in agriculture. That number almost doubles when you consider the people who are indirectly involved in agriculture. So how is Egypt handling this threat? We are very lucky this morning to have two excellent panelists who can help us take a, a really comprehensive look at this issue. Dr. Abla Latif is the um, executive director of the Egyptian Center for Economic Studies. Um, she's a presidential economic advisor. She has a long list of, of responsibilities to her name, but today we're basically relying on her to, to take a look and see the, the economic cost of, uh, of, of this issue. And Saral Batuti is a lead certified architect. She is the CEO and founder of eConsult, which is the country's leading green building and sustainability uh, um, consulting firm. She's also a presidential advisor on sustainable uh, development and uh, communities. Um, while we, do please feel free to send questions as we, uh, as we move along. We'll take the questions as they come and we'll put them to the panelists as they come. You can use your um, Q&A uh, uh, um, uh, uh, your Q&A function in uh, um, on your board and uh, we'd love to hear from you. All right, thank you so much. We're just gonna ask the panelists to kick off with a very, very brief set of opening remarks and then we will move into a moderated discussion. Dr. Abdel Latif, can I start with you? Yes, thank you very much, Jet. Uh, good morning, everyone, and good afternoon and good evening, wherever you are. Um, let me start by uh, not talking about Egypt, but rather talking about climate change in general. Uh, when we talk about climate change, we are talking about heat, basically, and concentration of heat. And this heat is affecting the environment big time. It's affecting the life of the human beings in, in every way, in the water availability, in the food production, in, 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 the, in the health, in every, in every aspect. The, the, the climate change was not taken seriously by the entire world, actually, uh, um, like 10, 15 years ago. Okay? It was not because nobody was paying much attention to it. When the, the Stern um, report in Britain first came out, um, it was not taken very seriously. And, and the awareness in general of the, of the uh, climate problem and its impact on the environment was actually very weak. This has obviously changed significantly in the last 10 years. We look at the situation now, we find that last year climate change was seen as the most serious problem to be faced by the entire world. Uh, this year it's taking the second position after obviously, and, and, or for 2021 actually it's taking the, the second position, first position obviously being for uh, uh, diseases and with the pandemic and everything that we're going through. But it is definitely on top of the list along with all costs that are uh, um, associated with it. Um, the two questions that need to be addressed by the world and by individual countries, Egypt no different, okay, is what are the actions that the country has done in order to try and uh, mitigate the impact of the climate change. The climate change that is happening naturally, okay, 
irrespective of what we are doing on the earth here playing our game, all right? But there are changes in climate that are taking place. The changes are actually uh, changed and created uh, countries. I mean, Egypt itself is an outcome of the change in the climate. Okay, it was a forest at a certain point, all right? So, uh, um, so the, first, the first question is what are we doing to mitigate the impact of what's happening? And the second question is how to stop our contribution to making the situation worse. These are really the two key questions. Man has messed up, okay? And I'm just going to end my introductory note with one small, very telling, um, not joke, okay? It's black comedy, really, that was sent on, on mobile at a certain point. It showed the, the Darwin uh, evolution, the monkey changing, you know, until it became man. And then man is returning back and saying, I'm going back, I messed up. I messed up the world, I messed up the planet. All right, so, and let me uh, stop here. Thank you, Thank you so much. We, we will get back to a lot of this in a, in a minute. Can I, uh, Sarah, can I ask you to, to just chip in? Hi, everyone, and uh, thanks for inviting me uh, to speak. So basically, um, I'm thinking more of the positivity that we're seeing at the moment. There are some some changes in the mindset to how we are approaching climate change in general. And if you look, let me take on what uh, Abla is saying. You know, recently we saw something that was just magnificent, but it was very awkward and everyone embraced it. And suddenly because of COVID and because we're consuming less and we're going out less and production is less, etc., there was this kind of media frenzy over you know over dolphins coming back in venice and swans crossing the street and sharks showing up in the nile and while this is completely mad um and you know and it takes fake news to higher heights the fact that people amidst all of this unknown took notice to stop and say you know the lack of human activity has resulted in suddenly a better environment even though it was you know illustrated to be something more cartoonish but this is exactly what we need to capitalize on when we're talking about how we are viewing climate change as not some abstract thing where it was in the 80s where it was a bunch of scientists you know measuring how quickly ice was melting somewhere in the polar climate change has become a hot topic in households relevant to people cross age, cross sector, and cross income strata as well. So there's, this is a huge, huge shift in the mindset that where it isn't just government that is trying to find um, solutions to it. It is also the private sector, but also the individual, you know, that anthropological course, we are all trying to think of how we have contributed and everything. So. An interesting thing that I would love to bring in today's conversation is the idea of how do you form policy and who takes the actions and, and where are the priorities set? Because when dealing with climate change, there are four factors that we have to take in mind. The first one is that climate change is at a different time frame and the results of climate change take a different time frame than the one where a specific policy is set or a company exists, or a technology uh, is introduced. Mm. So you're talking about longer time, uh, time frames, more intermediate, and also immediate results that we are facing today that have taken thousands of years to accumulate. Um, that's number one. The second thing is that we have to bear in mind that we are forecasting the conditions for the future. We're forecasting conditions for people who are not born yet and how the world is going to look for them and how our actions today are going to um, uh, result in this condition that they will be living in. So forecasting is a, is a very new way of taking action and taking policy because you're doing it into the unknown. The second thing is, is that it has become a sectoral issue, which is going to be part of what we're discussing today you know, how climate change filters in to different sectors is very important. And the final one is that there is a huge role for awareness and a huge risk at using awareness to talk about climate change. And where do we strike that balance? So I think we've got plenty to talk about. I'll stop here. 
uh, Miret and, uh, and, and let you get on. Thank you so much. Um, we will be coming back to those four points in a bit, but um, if I can get back to Abla for one second, one of the things we were discussing is how the, one of the things that Sarah had suggested actually was how the government was handling this. How is the government handling this? I mean, how, how, much in, how much of the work on this is being done by the government? How much of it is being done by private sector? Uh, is there a clear policy framework for, for handling this issue? Um, actually, there is not a clear uh, framework, all right, if you want to have a very uh, quick conclusion. But let me explain where the problem is. Um, the problem lies in exactly the difference between um, economic growth, development, and sustainable development, okay? The increase in the emissions, the damage, to the climate are very much associated with all the existing efforts now for economic growth based on uh, um, um, fossil fuel and the emissions, et cetera, et cetera. When you move up from growth to development and sustainable development, you start to pay attention to future generations. And climate change is right at the heart of this. Sustainable development, you are considering the interests of the future generations. You are considering the impact on the land from uh, too much plantation or using strange uh, uh, chemicals. Mm -hmm. So climate change okay, is at the heart of this because what you are going to pay now in order to clean the environment and protect the climate is going to have its benefits for future generations. So it's not seen now, okay? Mm -hmm. And this is the point that actually Sarah just mentioned a minute ago. This is at the heart of the sustainable development fight not only for the climate change, but for everything else. Mm -hmm. So using your resources efficiently, uh, um, taking actions that would protect the future generations, all that, okay, all that lies uh, uh, at the heart of sustainable development and is not very well perceived. Because it's not well perceived, what you see is efforts for economic growth that do not take as an integral part the climate change and its protection, all right? So the thinking is as follows. We are going to have our efforts for the economic growth, all right? And we are going to do some, to adopt some policies in order to try and mitigate the climate, the effect of the climate, uh, um, of the mm -hmm. climate change. They are looked at separately when it should be an integral part of it, okay? Because of this missing key point, you find everything else. This is the top of the pyramid. When um, the minute you look at that, then you find an institutional structure that is really not helping you much in dealing with the climate. You have a ministry that is in charge uh, and responsible for the uh, um, environment, okay, and for putting the environment, the environmental policies. However, when there are negotiations in Paris to talk about the Paris Agreement and all international negotiations associated with the climate, the one, the, the main speaker is actually the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, okay. Mm. There are representations from the Ministry of Industry. Um, uh, when you talk about the desertification, you find the Ministry of Agriculture talking about it completely. There is very little coordination among them. So what you have is an agenda that is scattered among institutions. And it is scattered among institutions because the awareness of its integral nature in sustainable development is not there. And this is really the top of the pyramid and the key and the key issue. Because of that, we don't find the policies that really, that we are hoping for. What you find are efforts, you find attempts, but you know, it's like the, the outcome is actually very limited. What you find is private sector that is paying a lot of attention, especially multinationals, especially companies that are involved in exports, they're giving a lot of attention to try and protect the environment, to try and use uh, uh, green, uh, green measures, et cetera, et cetera. But at the level of the economy, it is not there because the awareness of its value is not there. And it looks like it's far, like it's far away. The Western world has realized that it's happening very quickly. All the, the mess up that man has done, all right, is making the climate change uh, very serious and happening very quickly. This awareness is still not here, not at the level of the governments and not at the level of the individuals for sure. All right, thank you. So I am 
we're definitely going to come back to that. Um, but I'm going to take a, a, a part of what you said and ask Sarah something because Sarah, you've been quite critical of uh, um, of having this issue framed as an environmental one. Why is that? Okay, the thing is, if you if you look at the issue of climate change, because the result and the impact of climate change is not purely environmental, then creating solutions or addressing it should not, should be at the same scalability as where the problem is. So for instance, if I attribute solid waste to the Ministry of Environment, mm -hmm. it will not be resolved because there are economic arms and there are social arms and there are behavioral issues that need to be attributed. Putting the, the, you know, wrapping this issue of climate change or compartmentalizing it to be an environmental issue alienates the very people that should be doing something about it, which is again, bringing back to Abla's comments about being scattered. So in, in looking at the policy, we have to look at the direct impacts and the layers of impacts for this. You know, for instance, now, you know, we've just, um, there was something on, um, uh, on, on Twitter the other day, of course it didn't make breaking news, but it was on, you know, the Twitter sphere about the commodification of water mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and, and, and sort of attributing a cost to water and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. these, these kinds of attempts to hold on to something as large and as fluid and as continuously moving and changing and affecting people in such a fluid way and trying to just stamp on it. You know, this is a purely environmental problem. And if you add the cost, it will make people behave themselves. You know, this isn't how policy um, can be formed simply because it's a changing it's a changing issue, even with the Paris Agreement, when it was set at the beginning, the, cert the certain targets of staying, you know, below 2.5 degrees Celsius. Well, now we're moving into, we've already surpassed that. And now we're talking about five degrees. Why is it? It's not because the intention behind setting this grand scale policy was wrong. It is because it is continuously changing. The variables are continuously changing. Just the same as that, you know, creating the vaccine for COVID took a very long time because you simply didn't have enough information about the disease at hand and it kept on changing. All of these inputs and variables in the scientific process were changing. You know, we didn't know enough. And climate change is exactly the same way because of that time issue. So I would, I, I, I mean, if I can just sort of ask you something, I would actually argue that the COVID vaccine actually came around quite fast. Uh, normally vaccines take a longer time to develop. And I think part of it was um, for two reasons. One was that enough work had already been done about this kind of vaccine for them to be able to move faster on it. And the other one was the overwhelming urgency. I don't know what is as urgent as the current climate change at the moment when we are looking at changes from year to year that are not that are impacting health, that are impacting economic growth, that are uh, impacting livelihoods and will probably wind up resulting in, in um, conflict sooner rather than, than later. We're already seeing it in, in, in many cases in the world. So is there... Um, is there a, what is the holdup to faster action or more urgent action being taken on this issue? And this question is actually for both Abla and yourself, if, if, you know, if, you'd, if you'd both like to take a stab at it, because I think you may come at it from different sides. Definitely the cost of climate change has been very well reported. I mean, we know that for instance, you know, in the US it's predicted that it's almost about $2 billion annually, the cost of specific climate attributed damages or, or, or you know, loss to real estate, uh, water resources, energy resources, et cetera. 
there are costs there. We know the costs, the damage, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, the NDRC over here, we know the cost of flash flooding has changed a lot in the agricultural sector. We know that the heat, the drought, um, the added days where, you know, people are not going to work because there are these sandstorms that are increasing and stretching out longer summer months, um, additional damage to crop yields. So the economic cost is out there. It's just that the level of urgency is not as high simply because it, it the portfolio itself of handling climate change keeps on being passed around and isn't seen as a national, you know, effort that requires all sorts of facets of society to become part of it. It's not. It's been attributed to one ministry, you know, the Ministry of Environment. Mm -hmm. um, and the Ministry of Environment has its place within other ministries. Um, also, because there were a lot of governments and similar to all over Europe, the states, um, in so many countries, it was seen as it's a better solution to put the private sector at the forefront of the climate fight mm -hmm. because they were so visible. So the first action was not to, you know, years and years ago was not to look at, you know, uh, destroying the Amazon um, as an issue that, you know, is about, you know, having the Amazon as the lungs of the world. It wasn't seen as that. It was, you know, wildlife and more about wildlife rights. It wasn't seen as an actual carbon, um, absorbent, you know, critical part of the planet. Mm -hmm. The same thing when it comes to, you know, putting up, what are we going to do about the oceans? And do we look at that and look at the private sector and say, you know, you are the producers of plastics, you should be the ones fighting for this. So it, it, it's been diluted in a way because we have been quick to just allocate it to something very specific rather than raise the urgency in the way that COVID has. It's affected everybody and every government and every age group um, and every gender as well. So this is the kind of thing. Climate change is an urgent, relevant, overarching crisis. It's not one that is the cause and effect of something. And it's not one that could come down under a long list of what do we need to deal with right now and what could we push on later. All right. Thank you so much. Abla, let, let me ask you something. Sarah raised um, something important here. Now, she, she said um, the Environment Ministry has its place and the private sector has been asked to move on this. Now, I don't know that the private sector necessarily is the, the, the best gatekeeper for this issue because, of course, you have... Uh, um, you know, you have business interests. And that brings us to the struggle between climate change mitigation and economic growth. Um, could you speak to that a bit? Yes, uh, let me just step back a little bit and, and, and talk a bit about the economic costs and the estimations. Um, of, um, by, by 2050, it's expected to be $8 trillion, okay, globally, the, the, the damage, uh, the cost. Uh, associated with the climate change, which is a scary number, yeah. all right? And yes, the costs are known and, and, and we know where they come from. The market costs are known definitely the effect on the agriculture, the fisheries, the forestry, the energy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we often forget the value chains that are associated with each and every one of them. So it's not only an effect on agriculture, it's going to affect everything else. But yeah. then more importantly, there is the non-market cost as well, the cost to the human health, the cost to the uh, uh, ecological systems and all, all the nice things that that we again are enjoying life so I really I keep remembering the picture of the guy stepping back and saying I'm going back because I must all right yeah. when you look at a country like Egypt okay you have to be very careful here. Um, first of all the issue of climate um, change would never be put as a top priority for the country as a matter of fact it's being looked at as a luxury item Mm. Why? Because we have a zillion other problems, mm -hmm. because we are struggling. We're still struggling with a lot of things. We're struggling with poverty, we're struggling with structural reform, we're struggling with institutional reform, etc., etc. So this comes, it's almost a luxury item to look at. Okay, Globally and in the more developed countries, it is different. It took a long while to reach there. But in our case, it's been, it, it took a much longer time. 
especially that the impact is felt by the future generations more than the present one, although we are starting to get the feel for possible problems with the water, etc., etc., etc. Okay, so this is number one. Number two, should it be the responsibility of the private sector alone? Absolutely not. Of course not. The government must be on, on top of it and must push, but the government doesn't necessarily have to do things with its own hands. What it does is what governments do, which is put incentives, adopt policies, which guide the behavior in the economy in such a way okay, as to make it go in the right direction. The right direction of what? In answering the two questions that I raised at the beginning. If you are talking about mitigating the, 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 the climate uh, change that is happening, okay, anyway, irrespective of our interference, and we are talking about uh, rain, and at the end of the day, it's concentrated about heat and everything, but suppose that the rain in Ethiopia are not as frequent as they should, then yeah. the, the Nile is going to be very, very seriously affected. What are we doing about that? Are we adopting the policies? This is where the government is in order for uh, pricing of water, in order to make sure that we are using our resources as efficiently as possible, that we are increasing our productivity as much as possible. Okay, so this is a role by the government, all right? Whether we're talking about agriculture, whether we're talking about manufacturing, there are policies that can be and should be adopted, okay? The private sector is there, it will respond to the, to the incentives. So the government needs to be aware that at the heart, or before even talking about the climate change, they have to fix their, their, their economic problems, okay? Their institutional issues, their structural issues. It's all part of a much better performance and target of sustainable development. So the private sector cannot be asked uh, uh, to do it all. Unfortunately, the policies that we are adopting, okay? are actually more often than not in, in, in inconsistent. And I want to talk about that, but I don't know if you want to talk about that now. Or... I, I, I do actually, but I'd also like you, I mean, when talking about it, I'd also like to, ask, to address a particular question. Is the government of Egypt equipped to efficiently regulate such policy at the moment? And then, I mean, afterwards, I'd like you both to talk about water pricing, but at the moment, it, while you're answering your question now, Let's let's see if we can fit regulation in there as well, please. Okay, is it, is it? I think any government, whether we're talking about Egypt or any other country, all right, uh, it can be fit, okay, if mm -hmm. it takes the measures and it allocates the resources and it does the thinking that it needed to ad to adopt the right policies, okay. Mm -hmm. if, so so whether it's equipped, you cannot say that right now it's not equipped as it stands because we need bigger changes, all right? But you can, okay? And let me give you again an example from policy on that. Please. Okay? A very simple example on policy. For example, we have industrial policy. We have a policy in order to try and attract certain sectors for investment, for instance, in industry, all right? The industrial policy is putting incentives to encourage investment in certain areas. At the same time, we have environmental policies to clean up the pollution and the mess of the manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Why not have industrial policy from the beginning, okay, that encourages the use of the proper technology, clean technology, green technology, so that you would not have the pollution at the end, all right? So the, the policies are not adopted in a way that makes you uh, achieve your target uh, uh, faster. Is this because the government is not equipped no, it's not the government, it's not, not the government because the government is not equipped. It's because the government is not having the proper policy framework for doing things. Yeah. It is not having the institutional changes that are needed in order to reach that. You see my point? This is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Fantastic. Can we both, uh, I mean, both of you maybe address water? Because, I, I mean, you, you've referred to, to um, Climate, miti uh, climate change mitigation policy as being something of a luxury at the moment. And in keeping with Egypt's many other priorities, you know, one it's can understand easy. that. What? Yeah. Sorry? I'm saying it's perceived as, I'm saying it could be yes. perceived as of course. a luxury. It's of course. A luxury. It of course. Must. Of course. So it's being perceived as a luxury. How long is it likely to be perceived as a luxury in light of issues like water scarcity. Now, I, again, we're, when we move forward a little bit, we'll, we'll be discussing 
water scarcity, but I know that Sarah also has concerns in that it isn't simply water scarcity, which is an immediate and easily recognizable issue, but one of the biggest problems is heat. Am I right, Sarah? Yeah. So when it comes, when it comes to the level of urgency, you know, one of the interesting things is that when you move across to different areas in Egypt and across income stratas. And, and um, I noticed that there's one of the questions asking about how vulnerable is the Nile Delta and how vulnerable is Alexandria to this. So they're both incredibly vulnerable to rising sea levels, which is an immediate cause due to heat. Um, and these rising sea levels, they pose different, different risks at different communities. So the first one is incremental damage to real estate and infrastructure, which would be the case of Alexandria. That's mm -hmm. direct, you know, you, you do have, that, that's very clear. Um, the other one is for um, soil erosion and also in lower income level areas is that you can actually have contamination to household water supplies and sanitation. Mm -hmm. um, so, the issue of water and rising sea levels and flooding and drought and all of these things which are related to what happens when, when uh, the heat and temperature is increased, other than the direct one, which is, you know, discomfort and health issues, etc., is all tied together. Um, the release of heat in terms of Egypt's, you know, um, uh, carbon emissions, we, we as a developing country, as a very populated and developing country, we actually have very, very humble numbers into uh, carbon emissions, not because this shows that we're not doing much, it's because we are not manufacturing enough. Um, we rely on imports. Uh, more than exports. So if you look at the way you analyze carbon emissions of countries, you can understand where they are in terms of their developments and their consumption and production patterns, uh, to answer your question. Um, so there are lots of different areas where the urgency is seen by government, but it's not seen as a direct cause of climate change. So very high on the agenda for low income communities is this issue of sanitation and clean drinking water for about 3000 of the very poor villages in Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are heavily populated villages. Um, also for new communities, the supply of uh, drinking water. That's very high on the agenda when it comes to the investment in the project, when it comes to who's going to take care of this in the project, but it's not seen as a climate change problem. It's seen as an infrastructure um, and provision of service uh, mm -hmm. uh, challenge. So this is this is one of the things is that the 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 use of a more holistic way of mm -hmm. analyzing the problems and looking at the grassroots of climate change problems will create the better policy of resolving them or at least at the very least putting in place a policy framework that allows planning because we are going on a trajectory of Egypt is young, 60% of Egypt is young people. They need employment. Yes. We have a fast and aggressive um, development plan for economic growth. Yes. We are building and building and building nonstop. The fastest growing sector is the construction sector, which happens to also be the one where it's a very water intensive, intensive sector. And also at the same point, it's a very high carbon emissions emitting sector. Um, and that's the fastest growing one in Egypt. You know, where are you going to put all these people? They need somewhere to go. They need housing, they need schools, yeah. they need hospitals, they need drinking water. They also need food. So we are developing for needs filling in specific gaps. But while we're doing all of this, we have to realize that we are depleting water as a resource because that's the one where we can't you know, push a button and create and we definitely cannot be importing it. And the second one is, is that we have to also look at how people are moving around because of climate change and climate migration and the vulnerability groups you know, women and children and elderly are definitely more vulnerable. And these are the ones that require the social protection me measures more than anyone. So it, it's embedded. It's embedded in every single one of these societal problems and economic problems that we are discussing. Um, 
I hope it's, uh, I'm, I'm trying to show that as much as possible. No, I, I, I think you have. I, I think what we're also saying is we are consistently, I mean, it, we being the world, but um, specifically in this case, I think as a country that is trying to balance uh, growth and and uh, conservation, I, I does appear that growth is possibly uh, winning out a little bit. But I, it also you you mentioned sectors, and I, I'd like to come back to Abla for for two things. I mean, one, it does seem to to clarify or at least point out your argument that. Uh, there is a lack of a consistent approach to this issue. But the other one, the, the other question I'd like to ask is about the different sectors of the industry. Um, is there a difference between the private sector, the public sector? And then, of course, some sectors have overlapping, uh, uh, um, overlapping concerns and interests, whether they're upstream or downstream. Can you, can you maybe address that a little bit, Abla? Um. Let me start by saying something. Um, the fact that we are interested in having fast growth mm -hmm. does not necessarily mean that we deplete our resources too fast. Okay, I think um, we should or we, or we are. Sorry. We are and we shouldn't. Okay, all right. We are and we, I think mm -hmm. I think that. Um, balancing between sectors is very, very important in the country. This is part of mm -hmm. prioritizing the use of resources mm -hmm. and the, maybe the concentration on construction, okay, could, and I'm hoping that in the future, it's going to slow down um, a little bit because it is consuming water and, 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 it is, and this is critical for for climate change and we have also um, cities in Egypt that are not um, that are not inhabited yeah so there are many policies that can be adopted to spread the population we are living on six percent of our area but yeah. within the six percent we are on top of each other in in two governorates all right so I, I think I think the uh, the focus on the construction as a sector for growth is something that's going to that needs to slow down a little bit in the future and give a lot more focus to manufacturing. Manufacturing is the job creator, okay, big time. Yeah. <coughs> and we definitely need it because it's going to be the one to earn as foreign currency through export promotion if you push for exports and yeah. if we encourage investment in import uh, um, substitutes. So I think this is important. The message is we do not necessarily to be, you know, selling one for the other. We can do both, okay? Mm -hmm. Like encourage growth in the areas that do not necessarily consume or, or affect the damage significantly. And as we go about them, we do something. For instance, for instance, when you talk about manufacturing, we do have a program for encouraging exports, okay? Mm -hmm. There are certain incentives that are given to, uh, uh, to companies in order to compensate them for some of the problems that we have with the weaknesses in the infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, all right? An incentive could be easily created. They, they would give more if they are using means of production that are green or yeah. that produce less emissions. So even in the way of producing, you can make a difference. Okay. Mm -hmm. Having said that, let me answer your question directly about the public and the private sector. Mm -hmm. The private sector, uh, depending on what what type of private sector are you talking about, okay, we can talk about the extent of the damage that's taking place. If we are talking about the private sector that is involved in exports, if we're talking about the private sector that is affiliated with multinational companies, that is integrated in the international value chain, you find a much better adherence to the rules and the regulations, lower emissions, better conditions, a better consumption, wiser consumption of water, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which means less damage okay, to climate in the, in the actions. When you talk about the other type of the private sector, okay, which is the private sector that is addressing only the local economy that does not have any, that is not exporting, all right? They don't necessarily have to abide by certain uh, rules that we get from the Western world, all right? Mm -hmm. So here there would be a problem. And if you talk about the private sector in the form of the informal sector, that's another story. So one of the 
issues of dealing with the, with the, with the, with the climate change, formalization of the informal sector, even though it looks like it's something else, another topic altogether, at the yeah. heart of is to have much better respect for the, for the, for the climate conditions. The public sector, okay, really it varies again from one industry to the other. And here industries are actually quite uh, uh, different. Okay? If we are talking about the upstream part of the textile industry, for instance, where we are producing yarn and, and, uh, and fabric and so on, okay, mm -hmm. there is heavy use of water and uh, uh, there could be uh, uh, um, you know, pollution and, and, and negative impacts on, on, on the climate. You would not see that necessarily when you talk about the downstream option. So it, you cannot categorize completely public and private. Mm -hmm. What you, uh, uh, so it depends on the sector, it depends on the size, it depends on how affiliated you are. And the fact that the public sector does not respect much, okay, the environmental conditions is an indication for, again, the dissociation that exists between efforts for economic growth mm -hmm. and efforts for protecting the environment, that they are separate. One actually, they should be integrated with each other. If the government is more aware of the problem, and it needs to be more aware, it cannot be not aware, okay? I'm, I'm, from now on, it's going to become very serious with mm -hmm. the water issue, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and with the dam in, in Ethiopia on, on top of, we are going to have actually a shortage of water and we have to deal with it, all right? Of not all of it is climate uh, related, but it is there. And mm -hmm. this is going to force us to take measures. The measures that we are going to take are going to be positive, have a positive impact in our mitigation of the climate change. So it's going to happen indirectly. It would be much better if it happens directly with a clear awareness for the importance of the topic and that we need to take care of it by adopting policies at all levels in all sectors in order to uh, improve the way we are doing things and increase awareness of people as well. Thank you so much. So, so there basically... Is yeah, there is also uh, some positive feedback is that you have a lot more companies in the private sector that are willing to disclose their emissions. Okay. Because they, there is more and more need to create benchmarking for improvement. Mm -hmm. So whereas there were many local companies that were not, you know, undertaking this exercise to disclose their emission, they now feel that in order to become an international business and from a marketing perspective and also with the agencies, different lenders, donors, this you know, financial grant um, uh, environment that they are more than happy to benchmark improvement and have this sort of representation of any effort which wasn't existing before. I mean, usually before any kind of sustainability efforts within companies were attributed towards, you know, um, uh, productive health or, uh, mm -hmm. or um, you know, uh, building roofs uh, on top of uh, buildings in poorer areas or education initiatives or mm -hmm. nutrition, etc. And now we are seeing more and more of the private sector trying to come in, even collaborate together on um, water recycling, on you know, creating local solar farms, on also offsetting their emissions and creating different schemes, even though in Egypt we do not have um, you know, um, emissions trading schemes yet in, in, in place, uh, etc. But there is this increase in the reporting and in the transparency of companies, especially those who are multinationals operating in Egypt. And now we are seeing Egyptian companies doing that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in the past 10 years, I have been working with multinational. In the past three, four years, I have seen local companies that are coming to look for green buildings or retrofitting their buildings to save more water and electricity, etc. Because there is this need to become part of this um, effort and also the opportunity cost of missing out in doing this could set you back in your business opportunities later on when you're looking for expansion. So uh, that actually um, leads us on to something really important. So Egypt um, does want to present itself as a good place to do business and to get that edge then it needs to be uh, competitive in 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 many areas this being one of them you are um you're a lead certified architect 
Can you maybe discuss um, what is being done, for example, about architecture? Because we've already said the constructor, the construction um, sector is is one of the most water intensive. After ag agriculture, of course, is one of the most water intensive sectors there is. Can you maybe discuss what is being done? Okay. <laughs> The, the building and housing sector is one of the sectoral um, aspects identified in the Paris mm -hmm. Agreement, you know, transport, power, um, mm -hmm. energy, and building. Mm -hmm. And then when you come to building, it becomes this black hole. Why? Because this industry is one of the largest employers, because that value chain is, mm -hmm. is, um, is one that Egypt is, is, you know, incrementally attached to. Mm -hmm. So the building sector is one where you have the building materials that are mm -hmm. manufactured, you know, your cement, your steel, uh, all your bits and pieces that go into a building. Then there is a design and then there's the delivery of the design, which is very labor intensive, which is the construction and contracting um, phase. And Egypt has a long history of being very, very efficient in building quickly. Um, and we are now seeing 14 cities in Egypt, and I mean cities, some of them, you know, double the size of Paris. So that's the kind of scale that you're thinking. And there's a market and a fast growing market. The one reason why it hasn't taken off and become mainstream is because the rating systems and the regulations that are in place are not for Egypt. They're not for developing countries. They are borrowed rating systems, such as, you know, LEED and everything. So it becomes very expensive to have consultants and to build with that mindset. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing now is a different shift after much advocacy from those involved is that we have to see what Egypt has to offer in the product line. What are the materials that we make here? What are the kinds of buildings that work here and how do we adapt them and make them as efficient as possible using local knowledge? Mm -hmm. And so for the first time this year, we're seeing a push for a national green rating system, which has been recognized for industries, for school, commercial buildings, residential buildings, etc. We're also seeing a shift in the celebration of, you know, what is high end and what is is mainstream and for the longest time Egypt is celebrating having you know these luxury compounds and luxury uh, um, areas where you have 17 golf courses why do we have 17 golf yeah. courses when we do not have a single Egyptian who has made it to that you know to the Tiger Woods list onwards yeah. so it, it's it's a very strange way that people are looking to analyze this so one thing is to localize the rating systems and get the technology and the know-how to be localized, accessible and affordable so that people can start doing this. Um, and architects like myself can actually start pushing for growth in that sector of green buildings. The second one is that for the construction sector, um, and, and for many sectors to do with, with water, uh, the provision of water infrastructure and energy, you have to get resource management early on in the education curriculums. So that when you graduate the next wave of engineers and, you know, and, and people out there into the international and global employment market and national market, they need to have an understanding that good design is efficient design. Mm. You know, that we are dealing with inputs that are depleting, like water. So now, for instance, having large gardens and swimming pools and hotels with swimming pools and everything, people are looking more at arid plantation, at less use of water, at um, recycling water in many of the universities, on campuses, in schools, etc. They're looking at hydroponic farms, renewable energy integrated, and also solutions. All of that, mm -hmm. and you add on to that also behavior. How yeah. prevalent is that? I mean, I'm just when you say people are looking at uh, uh, recycling and, aqua, and aquaponics and, and and how how prevalent is that? It's now been introduced in every single curriculum to do with engineering and architecture across nationwide universities, but they, were, they have been in place. There are master's programs in sustainable development and everything in many of the, um, 
of the uh, international universities. But it's becoming part, there's at least a course in there, you know, uh, there's at least a lecture uh, list in there that comes in and talks about water, energy and material saving, which equals good design. And we need that. And we also need to revisit our indigenous way of building in Egypt because they had very limited resources at hand. And there was a lot of creativity in Egypt with agriculture, mm -hmm. with how people cook, how they consumed, how they recycled, how they built and how they moved around. Um, this is an integral part of all nomadic culture and ancient Egyptian culture. It's there. What we need to do is revive and tap into the reasons why and use that kind of mindset again to be more creative and bring in the solutions and create the correct policies to do so. So, so I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry. No, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, other than than revive and and reconstruct, is there a role for for at least for, for the government as well as businesses for research and development into this issue? Absolutely, absolutely. We cannot resolve the problems that we have now with climate change and with the depletion of water before we get into the research and the R and D is the one that's going to say what kind of solutions are scalable for Egypt and accessible to use, because we cannot keep on borrowing foreign solutions that remain in a certain um, tier or at a certain level, like you, know, like you have LEED certified buildings that cost X amount, mm -hmm. or you know, um, the difference between Tesla solar panels and other solar panels that are manufactured at a fraction of the price somewhere else. You know, they're still trying to do the same thing, but it's creating appropriate technologies and appropriate solutions using local know-how. That's the formula that's going to fit. And that's the formula that is going to salvage many, many, many countries from the immediate effects of climate change because it cannot be borrowed all the time. Um, you know, we have, technologies creating energy out of algae and that's all well and good if you're somewhere <laughs> else but you know over here that's not how it works we have the sun and we have certain geographic spaces where we have air we have fantastic building materials and natural stone resources that can build the rest of Egypt mm -hmm. so if we're lucky enough to to allocate our blessings and our challenges and forecast you know, something like the water issues, we'll be able to do the planning that gets government to introduce regulations because they know at the end of it, we're gonna get in trouble here and here and here. So knowledge and creating that knowledge platform and being very transparent on future challenges will get better planning to come along so that we don't have surprises in 30 years when we realize that 15 kilometers inwards of Alexandria, we have loss of real estate, that we have certain crops that we cannot grow anymore, that we have reverse migration into cities, whereas we are investing outside the cities, and yes. so on and so forth. Yes. Thank you. So, um, Abla, if I may, we've got seven minutes left. Um, I would like to go back for just a moment um, to the gap between uh, uh, policy and need and planning. Since, uh, I mean, you, you spend of your, a lot of your time working on, on policy work. Um, how do you suggest Egypt moves forward on this at the moment, bearing in mind that time is, is precious and uh, um, there are serious obstacles to be uh, overcome. But if you, were, if you were handing over policy advice, what would be the, the, you know, what would you start off with immediately? What needs to be done immediately? Um, okay, let me, let me start by um, showing you the nature of the problem by an example that's actually related to housing. Okay, that uh, Sarah was talking about. We have the sun, we have the highest sun exposure, actually one of the highest in the world, all right? We have solar energy. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm showing you something that the government is aware of, okay, and sees. We have solar energy, solar energy is important. It's much better option than the uh, uh, fossil fuel uh, for as a source of energy if we 
when, whenever relevant, whenever we can use it. So one of the areas is the housing, all right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there are solar heaters that can be put in buildings, all right? There are measures that can be adopted by the government very simply and very easily that would link the policy to the need, okay? And to mm -hmm. the future vision. Mm -hmm. You know that solar heaters are a good idea. Why not have the solar heaters as part of the codes for any new building, okay? We are making new buildings. Individuals are making new buildings. Mm -hmm. Why not have this as part of the code that it's a must, that mm -hmm. they would have something like that? Or mm -hmm. if they do it, then you are going to release them of certain uh, uh, obligations, for instance. Our problem with policies comes at different levels. At the lowest level, our issue is that we do not close circles. We do not complete the circle. In other words, you take a measure, but you do not necessarily <coughs> take the other measures that complement it so that you get the full, the full benefit. And let me give you a small example that has nothing to do with climate. Let's do financial inclusion, completely out. Mm -hmm. you, have the, you have the retired people having those cards and they cash their, their salaries every month. We're mm -hmm. very happy that they have the card and this is a, a key element in financial inclusion. But when you look at it carefully, those people take the cards, put them in the machine at the beginning of the month, cash the money, and then spend the rest of the money, the rest of the month spending the money, all right? Mm -hmm. The correct solution and the ideal solution and the closing of the circle is to make their card like a credit card so that they can actually start buying from it. They know that at the beginning of the month, they will put some money in it and they can go ahead through the rest of the month spending that money. Mm -hmm. So completing circles is is critical for solving issues. Now, the gap, how to do it? I think, and I am a very strong believer in that, that Egypt's biggest problem is an institutional, is an institutional problem, yeah. and it's an information problem. You have to have information, okay? The gaps exist differently in different sectors, okay? And with different time frames. So mm -hmm. when you put policies, you are putting policies for a specific uh, sector or the, in the short term, the medium term, in the, in the long term. Each one of these has its different calculations and has its different, different information. And mm -hmm. as you adopt policies, you have to do cost-benefit analysis of those policies to assess the, the, the plus and the minus. This requires mm -hmm. a lot of information, okay? Yeah. Also requires an institutional setup that allows for actions to take place. You cannot have the Ministry of Environment working individually on an issue that is also linked to other ministries and they are not talking to each other enough yeah. to come up. You cannot mm -hmm. have it announced on, in its own, on its own, a policy, okay? Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. would be perceived as a problem by the other ministries or by the private sector who's the receiver of all this at the end. This requires coordination. Mm -hmm. So a coordinated body, all right? Mm -hmm. That actually makes the institutional framework lies at the heart of this. Information mm -hmm. and the coordinated body and mm -hmm. the proper checks and balances, okay? These are the three elements. If you have the information, you can, and, and you can study the policies properly, okay? And as you adopt them and check their impact, you have key performance indicators, and you have the proper checks and balances by the parliament and okay, by uh, using expertise of others, you cannot continue to be the ministry that does the planning, the execution, okay, the, the, and then and, and the monitoring of your own, of your own stuff. The, the system that we have needs to be changed, and at the heart of it is the institutional report. So I mean, on on specific examples I, to this, I'm I'm thinking specifically of the Ministry of Petroleum subsidising uh, businesses, uh, uh, energy for businesses for the next five years, and effectively hamstringing uh, renewable in renewable energy industries for the next five years. Um, and you know, of course, this was done for COVID, but um, but it boils down to the same thing. I mean, they hamstrung renewable energy industries for the next five years. So the, problem is, is, the problem so is you have room for both. Yes. You have room. The more diversified your energy portfolio is, the better. 
because then you begin to have the comparative analyses, then you begin to, and it's, it, it, this is the best way, just in the same way as buildings. You have to invest in new upgrading of smart cities, this new word that is, you know, everywhere, smart city, smart city, smart city. And smart cities are not about how things are done, it's about how things are managed. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a smart city. And then you have investment in greener cities and then you have upgrading of decrepit, depleted cities as well. So just as much diversifying your solutions caters to a wider customer, to a wider need, to a wider policy that could be implemented, that could be explored later on. So there are many countries that have set in their 2030 agenda, you know, or um, by 2050, we will have electric cars that will completely re re replace petroleum based cars. Um, we will have 25% of Egypt will be sourced using renewable energy and we will rely on one, two, three, four, five. It's, it's there, but in order for us to have this policy implemented, it has to have that collective action based with a lot of know-how, um, uh, you know, coming together. So I'm completely aligned with what Abla is saying, um, aligned with some of the comments that I've been reading as well. Um, let, me, let me say one final word to add to, add to this. Um, diversification is definitely important, okay? But let me complete the sentence and say diversification with a clear view for the challenges, okay? And in that sense, the Ministry of Petroleum has to look, you know, at, 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 at the, all the angles and, and so did the others. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think we're running out of time. We, we are out of time. Thank you both so much. And uh, thank you to everyone who joined us. And as we said, this, this will be the, the first in a series. So we, we will come back to a lot of these issues because they're not going away anywhere, anywhere anytime soon. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you to our panelists, Dr. Abla Abdel Latif and um, Ms. Sara Al-Batuti. And uh, we hope we see you all soon.